What's up, Rob? Here we are again. All right. It's been a while. We took a few weeks off there. We both had some personal schnizzle going on. Yeah. Anyway. Things are you. back and we're good. And Family excited gets, to be yeah. back. It was a great, we had a great week last week. It was. A it was. Week. It was. Family seems to get in the way of everything, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, this week was great. I mean, listen, it's no surprise to you and, um, you know, some other people that are closer to me that, you know, I mean, I had a terrible April. I mean, I just absolutely got my head thumped. I could not get a clear read of what's going on. But this week, you know, I was starting to, I mean, even after all this time in trading, bro, I still get shaky. Man, am I losing my edge? Like, you know, I need to find a job. <laughs> right? Like, right. You know, this week has been phenomenal. And uh, it's really kind of rekindled a lot of the, you know, the drive and the spirit that I've had. So it's been great. Um, Rob, I don't know. I mean, have you had a fantastic week? It seems like it's been a really good week, actually. I had a pretty good read on things. Uh, some of the pullbacks, just even though they were intraday, were a little deeper than I thought. And I, I did miss getting on things or got on things a little later than I wanted to. Um, but overall, from a profitability standpoint, it was, it was still really good. That's what's um, up. Yeah, so it was good. I was getting in a little later just because I was a little, you know, we were in an area where it could have kind of flipped both ways, but now yeah. it looks pretty strong. I mean, we're surfing all-time highs, right? So, I mean, it's always hard up here, especially when there's no volume. I mean, it's just, you know, as you know, I mean, we didn't even trade a million. Well, did we, yeah, we did. We traded a million. No, I don't think we traded a million contracts Friday. I think that's old. I think we traded like 900 and some thousand contracts in the ES, which is not a lot. Um, yeah, Friday we only traded, I think, during the RTH session, like 835 contracts, yeah. something like yeah, that. Yeah, so volume is down. Um, and yep. we just kind of, but we did, you know, even though volume was down, we just kind of uh, had a nice balanced day. Um, went down and cleaned up, you know, some of the singles in Yes oh, and then Q and uh, yeah, the single exactly. prints from the Wednesday trend day. And yeah. then, you know, we're still still holding here. Well, I definitely want to go over, you know, some of these charts just to talk about some of the, the nice trades we've taken and kind of what we're thinking about moving forward. But um, even with that being said, just to kind of go back to the, you know, the low volume and, you know, balance days conversation, you and I track something called the five to 10 day range. And it kind of gives us an idea of, you know, how far we're expecting the market to move today because it's pretty accurate. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's really like, yeah, it's, it's better really than that. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. So, you know, Friday, you know, our five to 10 day range was 41.7 and we moved uh, 23 points. And so, you know, it's, we, that was half of the expected range that I was thinking. And um, yeah, yeah it, I just noticed that it's been like that a little bit. We've had these pretty monster trend days that were fueled by some news catalysts back to back on, uh, on Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, but it's been really interesting, um, just kind of the way that things are moving on this no volume. It's like we've really been kind of needing the news to kick things in gear. And when it's not, we're just chilling. So, right. Uh, first and foremost, I guess let's take a look at this weekly. I mean, you know, we've been trending up. We held this leg down here at 5015. Um, and really, once we got above this 35, it really just kind of just took off on everybody, which was which was great. We kind of broke out of this big. We were basically in a inside week for what, yeah. We had two inside bars uh, yeah. from that week down, which is usually a look for a reverse or at least test to the higher. So yes, yeah, and and we said, I mean, this was like the third week until they finally popped it on a Friday. So, anyways, we we finally made these all time highs. But what was interesting to me was is the tests that we did to get us to where we are now. So that's one of the things I wanted you guys to focus on here. So when you see this 5306 up here, um, we have a zone, um, something of that Rob and I mark out as support, 5289 to 5306. And uh, I just guys want you to remember this level because as we kind of bring over the daily time frame, uh, you know, we look at this RTH daily and, you know, we played this area perfect on Friday. But what I really wanted you guys to kind of focus on here was before we talk about what we think we're going to do, I wanted to talk about, you know, what we did, which was superb. Because for those of you guys who follow along in the Substack or, um, you know, on Twitter for that matter, 
um, you know, have, were able to kind of capitalize on some of this. So this was a daily that we had here at 5216 that I believe was tested during CPI uh, is what it was. And this really acted as the big catalyst for us to kind of get this launch. Um, we had this area here where we essentially, you know, came up and we played this area of resistance. And you can't see it on this RTH chart, and I will show you on the ETH chart, but we pulled back on CPI news essentially right here and played this, this 16. And this thing just launched it. And you and I, Rob, were able to really capitalize on this move. Um, you know, we held for 100 points, you know, and uh, this was superb, obviously taking profits as we were going up. But, you know, ultimately the runners were able to really kind of hang on to this thing. And it really just went super nice. Um, and so then the next daily that we're going to look at in succession here is this 05 with this 06 weekly, which is what we just actually did trade we just took Friday. So we're, we're going to come back to this chart because we, I want to talk about what's untested and what I think is a possibility. But, you know, just from a, a sake of, you know, what was played, um, you know, hopefully you guys can see here. This is what I was talking about um, that was played during CPI this 16. And Rob and I just, you know, we, everybody in the room and who is in Substack really just kind of just capitalized on this move. I mean, I, I know that I was taking runners all the way up into 64 and 71. And then we ended up, I actually get, I think I got flat around 80. Flat around 89. Yeah. 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 89. Yeah. So anyways, and it's still going, wish I'd have held it for sure. Um, this was the next sequence right here. So, I mean, we really, I mean, honestly, Rob, this was one day, right? And this was the news for the next day. And then this was Friday. So, you know, we've kind of just been <laughs> up, 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 oh, oh, oh. which makes it great. I mean, it's like, you know, it's for easy trading as long as you're not fading. Um, but, you know, we saw, we kind of saw the writing on the wall here, which was, which was beautiful. So, you know, this was, this was the next big spot. And uh, yeah, I mean, and, and just, you know, Rob, just to kind of cut you a little slack here, man. You know, this ultimately, I think this was the trade you were talking about that you got in a little late, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, and dude, you still made it work. I mean, it yeah. was still like it only went twenty points so far, and you were able to capture fifteen or or seventeen or something. So you know, don't beat yourself up too bad. But I, I certainly think that you know this was the ultimate target, as you knew when we were talking about when we got long from down here, um, and I still think we're headed there very much. So yeah. You got any thoughts uh, on this on this progression that we've kind of played here? So the only thing there's uh, one thing of note. If you go back to your RTH daily chart, we yeah. do we do have a gap there. Um, here. Yep. So that's yeah. just something to mark to be aware Absolutely. of. If we do come back down there again, we could come down and 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 test that gap area. Well, this is uh, a sweet a sweet daily in my opinion. I mean, you mm -hmm. can see. I mean, look how many reactions we had from this side. Yeah. This this lines up perfect over here, so I'm with you on that. So that was one thing, and I I'm really looking for just another push higher to get long again at fifty three thirty two twenty five. Like basically, Agreed. look for it to yeah clear it, go up, yep. Yep. have like a four hour close above it, come down and touch it, and That's then perfect. go. Yeah. yeah, and I really think this is happening. I mean, ultimately, I do. There's no reason to believe that. We're not going to continue to move higher. I mean, I've pulled fibs and all kinds of stuff and it just to kind of, you know, price extensions. And I took it off the chart, but I'm sure you guys do your own homework. This was like the 161, 161.8, by the way. That was the extension. That's funny. Like, yeah, it just happened to be that. I'm like, huh, okay. And we still didn't lose it. So here we go. Like on to the next one, right? So that's right. <laughs> anyways, I, uh, yeah, I think this is a, this is a great call out here. And one of the things that, you know, I look at big time and we've talked about this a thousand times. I like the TPO weekly. And um, one of the things that we have up here, which they started to fill out, was we still have a big um, bullish imbalance to the upside that was generated from this weekly off of March 17th. And so, you know, even though we've filled it up pretty nicely, we still have poor structure on the high on this weekly. And I ultimately, I believe we come to at least 53.75 to finish this off. But I will say this, Robin, and, and you pointed this out because of that gap, which happens to be right here, right? This is a really shitty structure. 
So, you know, we've basically created a double distribution with the POC on the downside. And then we have, a, you know, you can cut these double distributions into doubles, you know, into two profiles if you want. But, you know, this is shit. And when they come down and fix it, I don't know, but they definitely are going to. I mean, that is just hideous. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I have this in here <clears throat> to kind of, you know, be advised of the weekly gap, but ultimately, if they do rotate, and I have a very strong level right here uh, at, uh, I think that's the level you were talking about. Yeah, it's yeah. basically 71. 77. Yeah, so, yeah, one of those, yeah. Um, but anyways, even even with that being said, this is still really a shitty structure, that even though I think this could play, that they will eventually come back and kind of fix all this, because it just doesn't look like the rest of these, you know what I mean? So this is how it works. And, yeah. So with that being said, I thought it was something interesting to point out. I don't know if you were able to uh, look at that prior to, but um, so real quick, and as you wanted to say earlier, and you and I kind of talked about this previously, um, you know, we have, we still have this untested weekly if they were to move down here at 89, um, but that gap, as you can see, is directly below. And then the daily that you so pointed out for us at 71, happens to be this same, and I actually really like this spot, Rob, I have to be very honest with you about that, that this right here is like this four hour area where we turned up and popped. And, you know, this is still very much untested. Um, there's a four hour here, I turned it off, you can see it now. Um, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is, this is gonna be a great place right after they fill the gap. The only thing that concerns me is what I just showed you here was essentially this is the gap and we have that daily four hour, which is phenomenal, but ultimately they still need to come lower to kind of fix. Fix that as well. Yeah, so it's kind of like, eh, am I gonna take it? Yeah, probably will, but I'm gonna keep my risk, you know, fairly under control because I do wanna acknowledge the fact that they can't come lower. So, you know, I think we'll I uh, keep an eye on the VIX during that time when it does go down because we are so low in the VIX right now. Um, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought that up actually. That, that is something to kind of keep an eye on if there's a point of, support or something that would maybe help reinforce that gap um, as a level when we this do get thing is just ridiculous right now. I have to be quite honest. I mean, as we look at this, and I'm glad you brought that up because this is, I mean, we're really, not only are we in such a low VIX spot that it creates, you know, obviously the volatility is shitty, right? And we're, we have low volume and we're slow grinding and we're doing all kinds of jazz, right? But the thing that we're, you know, if you look at how many times this thing got a reaction at this exact price point. Exactly. It, it, it's <laughs> really hard to be like extra bullish, even though the chart says, yeah, let's get bullish. Like, you're like, man, this thing is so close to, I mean, what historically, if, I mean, history repeats itself, right? I mean, look how many times it's popped at $11.11. I mean, and we're at. We're at eleven ninety nine. We gotta be getting close to something. We gotta be close. <laughs> like, it just seems like it's this is the point where someone decides to pull the rug. It, for sure, it definitely feels like that a little bit. So, you know, I I'm glad you brought that up because I totally forgot about it. So, because it does look insane down here. It, it's really strange. Like the VIX is the one chart that has that this crazy boundary layer at the low, where you know it just right. really struggles, and you can see it. I, yeah. You know, and I, I know that VIX options are kind of shitty. I'll just be honest because, you know, Theta is working hardcore against you. And, you know, I, like you pointed out to me before that, you know, the VIX actually has its own volatility structure, which is interesting because everything else is all the stocks that we mess with work off of the VIX, VIX. and the VIX has its own. And so, you know, it also ha you also have to deal with that. And so, you know, I don't I mean, it's hard for me not to want to buy futures of volatility down here and just kind of hold it. But I mean, how low can it go? I don't know. Maybe the rest of the election year. I don't fucking have any idea. But this is just it's yeah. like it looks like such a juicy opportunity to get in for a hundred percent return at least. I mean, I don't know. It's just yeah, I mean, yeah. the scale on the right looks practically it looks like logarithmic. I know it's not, but it just looks <laughs> yeah, like we like it could easily like whoop, like yeah. and quickly. Yeah, I know. So that, you know, and I guess this kind of goes back again one more time to what you were saying. Like, here we are, super bullish. We're ready to clean this up. 
and you know it's easily could happen i mean we're only talking you know 50 points something like that but it, you just know at some point in time with the vix looking the way it does i just can't imagine that this is going to go on too much longer i mean i guess we don't know but i mean at least a, a pullback again it's going to take a lot for us to like come down right, right. Come, well, come down but a pullback somewhere is like okay i mean the vix kind of leads to that is a possibility at some point so right and if i think i that's that pullback i'm going to look first in that to that area with the gap and then right right, right a little right. bit lower at that four hour it's yeah. a good point that's a very, that's very valid point yeah because this whole area in here is still untested as well um which really makes a lot of sense to be quite frank um this four hour right here is untested and we got singles and there's a daily so you know do they want to punch through here and then clean up this this uh this profile they certainly could um it's this guy right here he's just hanging out so you know he's yeah yeah so yeah. anything's possible i mean it's certainly it's, you know anything's possible but for now we're looking up and i think that like you said uh before you know, this 32 would be a great place to get long if we get a nice four-hour close above and play it on the tops at the bottom side. What's interesting, it's actually the previous all-time high from April as well. So, I mean, that is fantastic confluence. That's not a swing pivot. I don't know what is. Um, the, the only thing that I am really kind of keeping an eye on, and, you know, we talked about this a little bit before, uh, even though I absolutely think we're going to make new highs, especially off of playing this structure here, um, you know, I am keeping eye on this 32 and really 40 area. This could do one of these. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I do think 40 gets a reaction. I don't think it destroys it. I think that if it gets a smack here, that this would be the place to kind of look for support to buy or somewhere in that general vicinity. Um, because we didn't really lose anything. I mean, yes, the support, we lost the support to the high, but the four hour leg is way down here. It's way down there. And yeah. I, um, we cool. don't have a ton of news catalysts this week. We do have some unemployment claims and PMI, but those are. I'm glad you, yeah. Yeah, there's nothing too monumental um, in terms of, of, of news. And the other thing that's making me pause for a little bit is, you know, we're starting to go into summer and we're seeing that range compression and we could like slowly drift down, fill in that area and then start to creep back up again. That's the other sort of scenario I'm playing with. Um, For sure. And, but I'm still more bullish than anything else. Like, I mean, you have to be, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's the chart tells us, regard, we're not trading the VIX. So as much as I'm watching it, right? Know, I, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm trading the, the S&P and the S&P says up for now, so. Until that shifts, um, you know, I do want to show one thing here, which is really interesting. We talked about how the four hour leg to lose the four hour support. And I'm not talking about the support at the highs that was lost, but to really kind of shift momentum, we need a four hour close below 72. Cause you know, the way that you and I do this, you know, this is our, this is our leg up, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, but for the daily, it's an even much more extreme case. And, you know, we were kind of joking about this before that, you know, it's really going to take a monumental occurrence to, to, you know, this is our leg at 92. And that's what made this buy at 16 when we talked about so sexy because we knew that, like, they have to hold this because if they close below this, we could really dump. So, of course, they held 16 and we went up, but we haven't made any other leg end structure. So they really technically, in order to lose on the daily, have to close below 51.92 on the daily, which is a long way down. <laughs> so, yeah. so I mean, we are so high up now um and with the 71 being untested and really technically 55 i mean i welcome a nice pullback you know i mean i, I really do at this point i mean it's you know, we're buying everything right if it's untested we're buying it so <clears throat> let me look here you also sent me something else that was all right so you sent me something else that we were looking at that obviously caught my attention. Um, you know, I'm, I'm into the metals and I was watching gold anyway, but you sent this over and it's pretty wild um, because look at copper, 36%. I mean, yeah. it's silver and silver did a lot of it this week. I mean, this, this was just a ridiculous push. We're going to look at these charts and then obviously gold's up big time too. But then, you know, we talked about lithium. You got to learn it. You got a little bit of the, the practices in lithium. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> That's crazy. For those of you guys who don't know, they're it's like they got little little children working in the cobalt mines in Africa, and uh, it, it's pretty terrible. But there's nothing we can do about it because you still love your cell phone and you still love your laptop. And I believe like 90% of the world's lithium comes from um, this cobalt mine in Africa. And so, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm kind of getting off the topic here, but you know, it, it's crazy because the, you know, people know in America, you know, we know like, you know, Elon Musk knows and you know, all these people that make our cell phones, they know, and uh, there's nothing they can do. You know, they, they need the lithium. They need the cobalt to make the lithium. I just saw too. We were kind of just sifting through here, and we saw that Google and all these companies got sued um, for having kids there. But anyways, back back to topic here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but yeah, this is you know I I'm kind of a big metals guy. You know I like gold. Silver has been a great trade for me this year, um, and then copper really. Copper was really impressive. And one of the things that Rob and I were talking about you know, before is that copper is a great indicator of uh economic uh like growth as far as uh, industrial side because you know you're used they use copper a lot in buildings for um, you know for all the wiring and stuff like that which again the majority of it comes out of china which is pretty insane but uh yeah i mean do you, do you know anything about this whole sector rob do you only enough to be very dangerous. Um, but what was what was more interesting to me is how well it's been playing our levels and oh, how right. well it's been responding to certain areas to to get us that lift off. And yeah. it has just been sort of like this asymptotic move, like just straight up from forty five percent from uh, to from the low. Yeah, there you go, forty percent since the lows of 2024 I mean, it's a huge move and uh yeah i mean this is if i guess if we're really truly using this to monitor you know industrial development i mean this thing is pushing hard so it's been pushing it. hard yeah, so i do know it. that there's been more like copper you know um scarcity you know because it is used so much and car companies have been trying to reduce the amount of copper because it's like 14 miles of copper in your car Kind of stuff oh really I didn't yeah know. and um but you know it's just required for everything in terms of like motors and generators that they're using for all the evs um so it's, yeah it's a, it's a huge it's oh, a huge good. part and component and cost of what these guys have been doing and trying to um grow their business yeah and i don't know if it's something that we can necessarily get away from right it's because no. it's, a great, it's a great conduit so you know, with that being said, and it's plentiful uh, to a certain extent, but you know, like we've talked about before, that all this stuff comes out of China. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's crazy to me. But uh, you know, this looks like a great place to get in on a retest if you want to buy the highs. Yeah. From a high time frame standpoint here. Yeah, that'd be a nice spot here. So you know, the other the other pictures that you sent me were gold. Um, we just had a fantastic gold trade that we called out in the room here. Um, so here's this gold, this gold trade here. Um, you know, we were talking about silver gapping up. And then, you know, here I was talking about if you feel that gold is going up, there's still some good levels to buy, which is 2342.1 all the way into 2322. Uh, it was interesting that I saw that the World Bank bought 24, uh, what is this, uh, billion dollars in gold in three months and the people from korea they're now selling gold trinkets and vending machines you can buy like like a tenth of an ounce of gold uh, at a time so like basically like 250 bucks um, instead of having to spend 2500 they're just going crazy up over there and so you know i just wanted to show like really and i think you talked about earlier like just how well our levels are playing um and you know like here's at 2342.1 I mean, we dipped into the four hour just a little bit but they've really just held this and you know this is over a hundred dollars higher this is not a this is not a joke you know um for those of you guys who understand what that is that's ten thousand dollars a contract or even a thousand dollars per micro so i mean this was a phenomenal trade and it, it seems to me like again just with the way everything's going commodities are in a super cycle would you agree rob that yes yeah, yeah absolutely I was uh, looking at uh, a couple books on the sort of like 10 year super cycles of that commodities hit in and we're in that sort of bull super cycle yeah. right now. And 
the sort of like macro reason that that happens is you know prices prices get higher, people see demand, they start investing into facilities and factories and things like that. Yeah, uh, and, to process and the, everything, and then they start to fill that demand, and then the prices come down. Some of those places close again, and it takes about ten years for that whole whole reaction to happen. And so, obviously, we are uh, supply constrained on the. On it's not places. to mention that the dollar is shit, right? And so, <laughs> yeah. and so these are actual tangible products, right? These are things that people can touch and feel and and have a value, and I think that's why. You know, gold and silver have always been, you know, considered that that hedge, right? Because you could basically take a block of gold or whatever, or whatever, anywhere and sell it. Uh, you may not get the best price, but it's a tangible asset, right? So people, you know, our money's only good for lighting fires, basically. It's only good because the U.S. government says it is, right? So, you know, this is, I, I also believe that this is another big part of why it's like Bitcoin kind of doing its thing. You know, it's just... Just, a, just a, I don't know. It's a personal belief, I guess. But mm -hmm. here's, uh, here's silver, and I wanted to kind of show it on a monthly view. You know, this thing is mooning, just mooning. And I believe the last time we had this pump to fifty dollars, there was some sort of manipulation in there. Do you remember those guys' names? Um, there was uh, some brothers that used to manipulate silver. And uh, let me look. Hang on. They were like buying all the silver, right? Here we go. Is the Hunt brothers? They began buying silver to hedge against inflation. They were believes <clears throat> they believe silver was undervalued compared to gold, and that owning silver would protect against hyperinflation. That's just them right here. Seventy-four. Yep. By seventy-four, the brothers purchased fifty-five million ounces of silver when it was priced at a dollar fifty an ounce. Holy fuck! Wow. Wow. And it ended up going to forty-one dollars for them. Holy Toledo. Silver Thursday, 1980, yep, that's up here, is an infamous trading day in which the price of silver collapsed. The collapse was precipitated by the failed attempt of three brothers to corner the market in silver. Interesting. So anyways, with that being said, I mean, silver has been in a range forever, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. And we're finally getting, you know, are they going to get back up here to towards all-time highs, towards this manipulation era? It's just really interesting how, you know, these markets, these markets work. A dollar fifty, dude. Look at this. $1. Yeah, they're doing fine. Dude, what? They crushed it. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Holy shit! But look, what? I mean, like if you got in in like ninety two, I like, think they didn't really move for a, a decade. Yeah, <laughs> no, you were in trouble. Yeah, this was this was a decade of absolutely. It was five dollars. That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. So anyways, super cycle. All right, so Rob, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Oh, no. I guess I want something I want you to talk about. I'm going to pull it up. So for those of you guys who, you know, know Rob, Rob's, in my opinion, a genius level coder. Um, he's a very humble individual, and uh, he won't say so himself, but the guy's really talented, and he's extremely smart. And uh, he is one of the guys that helps, you know, bring my, my projects and ideas to life. And uh, he has started, you know, he's coded a lot of stuff that a lot of you guys use right now for uh, Sierra Charts and Ninja. He's coded all our tools. Some of them were his ideas. Some of them were our ideas. Doesn't really matter. The idea is, is that he brought it to life and that is, and they work flawlessly. So I've obviously, now that I know that he is the man for the job, quested him with other tasks that we were, we're trying to automate and do things together. And Rob, you have really, I feel like you're, you know, You've been so deep into C plus and and uh, um, oh Python your charts and yeah. all this stuff that for so long that you know you're I really I mean the way that so I got Rob working on he's working a buddy of mine and him we kind of got together and we're working on a mispriced option strategy and he's got you know some really cool things going on with that and now he's working on you know trying to uh, automate this order flow type scalp bot that we're working on. And you were you really impressed me, Rob, because you were talking about how, you know, you're trying to use machine learning stuff, and you've started to reach out to, you know, these, like this Quant Connect that we have up mm -hmm. on the screen right now. Um, I was just hoping that, you know, without you don't need to talk about the strategies at all. I, yeah. I'm just kind of just I would just love to hear more about you know the evolution and things that's kind of brought you here because this is cool stuff, and maybe you could kind of fill us in a little bit about. Oh. 
How does sure. Um, so a lot of the stuff is built um, that I've been looking at is built in Python because Python is sort of the you know, the the language that a lot of quants have sort of like locked into to do their uh, research and work on. And wow. it has a bunch of well, the community is uh, enormous and and a lot of like uh, a lot of libraries have been built for uh, machine learning and. Um, a lot of the AI stuff is all built on top of Python. Now, Python's got its drawbacks. It's it's um, it's not a pre-compiled code, so it takes a little lot, a bit longer to to run things, and sometimes you know much 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 longer. Um, but for in terms of development and getting ideas down, um, Python has been sort of the, the way to go for the past few years. And so this is an online platform, Quant Connect, that's on the cloud that I use fairly extensively to do a lot of back testing and work because they have a ton of data that we can log into and get access to that we wouldn't have um, otherwise in sort of our other trading platforms. We also get the ability to back test things and we get the ability to bring in all these different sort of Python libraries and things like that. That's cool. And so, that way we can test a bunch of different parameters in a bunch of different regimes and see how they work. And so I've been looking at specifically some things around machine learning. And the the reason behind that is not to get, you know, super accurate, you know, it's going to be perfect all the time because we got a computer looking at it, but it will help with um, the different regime changes that we have, even intraday, you know, when things are slow, um, then, it doesn't require as much thing um, energy to move the market around uh, versus when you know things are fast or when things are um, when we have news events. And so, having something like this that will look at different times of the day and um, sort of in real time go through and check and see how things have operated different times of the day or even different times of the year or days of the week or after certain events that should all sort of help bring these data points together to help fuse an idea to help create like a scalping bot or something like that. So that's no. what I've been looking at. So let's suppose you had a, you had some bars and you had some ideas and the number that you'd sort of like eyeballed was I need, you know, 10,000 contracts in this sort of formation. Well, you know, maybe tomorrow it's 8,000 and the next day it's 11,000. What's the right number? So to have something that's a bit adaptive and constantly looking at these things and back testing them, um, to help shape that opinion is extremely helpful. It really helps take a lot of the sort of tuning that we do, especially in day traders, uh, out of the picture. So that's that's primarily why I've been looking at it. It's super neat. Um, you know, this is I haven't had a chance to really look at it all that much, and I know that you have been working. You introduced this to me about a month ago, but again, I'm no, I'm no coder. I'm the guy that looks at. It. It tells you like, hey, I noticed all these things. You there. notice these things, right? Like you, you'll yeah. see, you see yeah. these arbitrage opportunities, you know, yeah. in the market, and cool. trying to take advantage of those in, in a bunch of different ways. You know, this more than just one strategy, all you know, working to grow our portfolios. No, it's great. So, is this so? You know, when you say machine learning, right? And I and I'm I'm just mm -hmm. gonna throw this out there, like. Is are you going to essentially show it like a thousand different examples of the same thing with this, or how does exact how does you know from a layman's standpoint explain machine learning to me like in in terms of how you would use it with refining uh, a day trading scalping strategy? Okay. okay, so think about like how like machine learning works for um, for normal images. Um, right. If you have, if you want to, if you want to look at, you take a picture of a coffee cup and say, and have the machine identify that's a coffee cup. What you have to do is feed the thing thirty thousand images of different coffee cups at different angles, at different colors, and tell it, you know, and tell it, okay, there was a coffee cup in this picture, there wasn't in this one. You found it here, you didn't find it here, and over time, eventually, once it sees that thing, it can identify it as a coffee cup. Um, the issue about applying those same sort of machine learning languages in uh, trading is there's just not enough data. You know, each image is probably, you know, 20 megabytes. And when you're talking about um, trading, you only have open, high, low, close and volume and 
right. try to add some other features in there, like the speed or rate of change or how much time it was in certain areas. So you can sort of like add things to it, but at the end of the day, you really only have, a, you have a lot less data points to sort of play with. And so that's why I was looking at something that only looks uh, not as far back with a, as many data points and something that sort of constantly updates based on um, criteria that it's seen historically that has worked in this sort of similar regime before. Um, it's a way of dynamically um, adapting to the situation without having, you know, doing what you with normal data that you would get, since you can't feed it so much data that it's uh, it knows everything. And every time, you know, every day is different. There's different players, there's different news, there's different areas, there's different times of consolidation and acceleration. And so trying to add some of that, or at least a bit of a color to that to help it um, not become such a brittle model because oftentimes people create models and they look great in a back test and then you walk forward test with them and they either fall apart or they produce, I think the rule of thumb is whatever you see in your back test, you know, sort of say, okay, if it made a hundred dollars in six months, I should plan on making $50 in six months, you know, it's going to cut it by half. Okay. And then see, and then you have to actually watch that um, performance envelope over time and see when your strategy sort of breaks down and then it's no longer a valid strategy. So um, I guess in simpler terms, like suppose you had a strategy that worked with a, a 21 period moving average. Well, some days like 24 will be better and other days an 18 period okay. moving average would be better. Yeah, yeah. And so what are the different ways that we can look at the markets that say, okay, today's an 18 period day or hey, it's been a 21 period day up until two o'clock and now we need to kind of like change gears a little bit and change the parameters slightly. And it can, and it can, do, it can tell you to do that or it will do it on its own. It'll do it automatically, yeah. Interesting. That's It'll do cool. it for me, yeah. So that's, that's, that's basically the gist of it because you have this thing constantly learning with every candle coming in. So, okay, so let me ask you this. So I'm just going to throw something out there. Say that you like program this very rigid, uh, rigid um, rule-based system mm -hmm. and Sierra and Sierra, because you know Sierra only does exactly what it, you tell it to. What so, you tell it to. Yeah, so you do you take that, convert it to Python, essentially load it in here, and then you say, like, and then you tell it to optimize? Like, is that, like, is that ultimately how this thing works? Or what is... So what it'll be is it'll be basically something outside of Sierra chart running. Right. Um, that either then I can inject the signals to buy and sell into Sierra, or we do it on a totally separate platform like this platform. Oh, does this platform execute as well? Yes, yeah, we'll execute for us as well. I mean, it makes no difference where it comes from, right? Right, so, exactly. Long but if we wanted to see it, we can have something that fires and then shows the signal on Sierra, and then you can still take, um, you can still manually, right. you know, enter. So that's <laughs> another way of looking at it. The um, I do know that like a lot of big funds that do um, s not rules based trading, but if they're looking for specific patterns and some patterns like say a cup and handle pattern can right. be fairly subjective. So what they'll do is they'll flag it and then they'll actually have someone look at it visually and say, oh yeah, that actually does look like a pretty legit cup and handle pattern. I will take it. Um, <laughs> So, you were telling me that you actually know somebody that does Yeah, that. I know somebody at Bridgewater who does that exact same thing. They they you know, they basically take like MPEG images of of the um, of the charts. So that way they're basically photos and then they feed this photo in a big image recognizer. So it's exactly what we just talked about, but yeah. chart that way they With, interesting. Yeah, that way they take the pictures in. Well, this looks just based on this little video that's running, this looks like once you get everything loaded in there, the the the, you can fire and forget. A dummy like me could even go in there and change. You just go like, <laughs> hit the go button. Yeah, no, that's cool. It's really neat. So, so sorry. Yeah, it's just like yet another iron in the fire. Like this is one of those things we just got to keep working on, and it'll take time. But it, you know, it'll. I think it's going to be good. I, I saw that it has a cost, but it wasn't like insane. It's anything. nothing crazy. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, if you're like in a group or a team, you can even have um, a number of people contribute to the code and you know check code in and out and things like that. And really cool. it's uh it's 
it's pretty slick the way it's worked. And, you know, like uh, five or six years ago, there was a fair amount of cloud-based, um, uh, like Quantopian was the big one. Um, yeah, I remember. But, yeah, uh, Python sort of back testing engines and things like that. And this is sort of, I think, the last one standing that's of some real scale and size. Oh, really? So the other ones are, they went by the wayside? Yeah. So Quantopia is gone? Quantopian um, got repurchased by someone, and I don't think uh, he repurchased it. I think mostly for the email list and things like that. And he has been posting things on like a podcast, but it's usually okay. going after the community than having a, a that's a really interesting place platform. Yeah. yeah, I mean, honestly, that is the most expensive thing you can buy, right? The most valuable, right? Thing. So, makes sense. Well, that's cool. Sorry to put you on a spot like that. No, but. no, no. It's great. Like it's a, it's been a, it's been a, a big learning process in a lot of this stuff because when I first started trading, this is the path I thought I was going to do because of, um, I thought I would, uh, the emotional part would just be so much easier to have the computer get me in and out. But right. one, you still have an emotional component, even if computer gets you in and out, trust me, you'll see it like go in. You're like, why, why did it get in there? That's a horrible place to get. I would never get in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you just, yeah. you have to really just trust the process that you've done enough back testing and your win rate is such that that's a good trade. You have to just kind of like let, let it go, let it but it's, thing. um, it's, it's tricky. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. But initially I really thought, oh yeah, this would be no problem. But again, like, um, especially like a lot of the models, like, uh, don't have the same sort of returns as discretionary traders. Um, unless you start increasing the frequency of your trading, things like that. And that way you can improve the sharp ratio, uh, have less drawdowns. Well, it's, you know, so just to kind of go back to that, you, when you said the word discretionary trading, it, it kind of rekindled my, or our com in my brain, our conversation mm -hmm. that we had earlier about like these proprietary trading firms. And I'm not talking about like Apex and Earn Trade, I'm talking about like real proprietary trading firms like a S&P Capital or whatever, um, you know, they all want something systematic. Like it seems to me, and I know this from experience yeah. because I've been looking at firms and, you know, they, you could be an amazing discretionary trader with amazing returns and they still want to make it very systematic and to just to get away from the discretionary side. And, and I know that, you know, when you do the math that, you know, 10% of the traders make 90% of the money and the other 90% lose. But even still, like there are the 10% and they do make right. their money. We are a good example of that. And, but they still don't want that, right? Like they want what you're doing now, which is, you know, we talked about that. I'm not really sure the logic behind it other than maybe it's easier for them to know that this is their risk parameter. Like this is their win rate. This is their risk parameter. This is what it is. Because when you got a, you know, an emotional asshole behind the gun, behind the trigger, yeah. anything can happen, right? Like it, yeah. truly, it can truly anything can happen. So, but then you could have things like what happened in night capital with one of their algos destroyed like $400 million or $700 million in 15 minutes. You know what I mean? Like oh, you can really? also go the other way. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it's a, Basically, you really want to monitor it really fairly closely, have a performance envelope. If it gets outside of it, shut it off. You know, right. basically that's, you really have to kind of operate that way and see if what needs to be tuned or tweaked. And also try to limit the amount of variables that you have going into it as much as possible. Because the, the more variables you have, um, because that was one of the things I thought about, like originally, like, I'll just throw a bunch of stuff at it and I'll have the computer figure out which is best. And you tend uh, to have something yeah. that's not very good. How's that? Yeah, if it's machine learning, right? Can't it say, yeah. well, this is bullshit. Well, this is better or not. And so you really want to give it uh, quality, as much quality data as you can that you know has some sort of edge in terms of what provides that lift. Uh, yeah, so you're you're really really looking for some fairly narrow things. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, it's just it's just amazing to me the whole discretionary like where the industry has gone, right? Like it's it's very much all automated and and guys like me, um, who you know are don't know how to code but know how to trade, we're dinosaurs, you know, like 
you know, I can use a platform that's already all set up and you can show me how to do it, but to actually go in there and tweak it. like Yeah, go in and tweak it. I'm a, I'm a dead man. <laughs> no, that's the thing. Is I Like I said, like if you look at some of those market wizards, there's a couple of guys who do like systematic trading and do really, really exceptionally well, but most of the people who do outsized returns right. um, are the discretionary guys, especially with like the medium, smaller accounts. Now, if, once you're starting to manage billions of dollars it's a totally different game it's a totally yeah. different game you know and know. Right. yeah you're you're playing a different you're doing either market making and just doing millions of micro trades or you're like slowly you have some sort of macro picture and you're slowly easing into a position you have to do it really slow because you know you throw a million dollars down you're going to move the market and you're going to get bad fills and it's going to come back down so like right. Right. You really, really have to, it's a, it's a different universe. And so playing in the universe that we're playing in, um, you mean, you know, you I mean, still, you we mean people don't care about my cars? They don't care yeah, about exactly. <laughs> I don't think the market cares about my, you know, one lot in, um, CL or whatever. Like it's, it's not going to move the market at all. He's looking for my stop. I know. It's it's you're hunting for it. I'm that I'm convinced of there's, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that Goldman is watching Discord and saying, oh, yeah, this is where all yeah, the stops are. Yeah, there's a three lot parked up there's here. A <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take him out. It's totally worth their time and effort. Um, but, yeah, like a lot of those edges. And the thing is, a lot of those um, quantitative strategies that they found that have edges, you know, do they do erode over time. So you're constantly pushing and constantly looking for new strategies. And well, it's interesting that you said like, I mean, you you were talking about that before we got online, and we were kind of talking about how, I mean, not to toot our own horn or anything, but, you know, we've noticed that our strategy is, tends to be, I, I hate to call it timeless, but, you know, you can go back as far as you want, and the strategy is still solid. It still plays exactly as it should, which is makes sense because it's based on structure and so on and so forth. But mm -hmm. I did find it interesting that a lot of the strategies, and it makes sense that something from the 80s isn't going to work today just because the evolution of the markets, but... It, it is weird how these strategies do erode over time. I mean, you would think that if you had something that worked for 10 years, why would it just stop working? But, you know. Yeah, that's right. Um, but a lot of them, you know, based on different moving, especially historical quantitative strategies or like the turtle trading strategy. Right. Once, once a bunch of people know it, then everybody arbitrages against it, right? So as soon as that strategy gets out, then everyone's like, okay. going against it. So let's be yeah. real. Do you think that's really true? Do you think that's possible? There is yeah. a little bit of possible. Yeah, there is some of that that goes so on. Do you think? Do you think if half the world knew exactly how you and I traded it, our strategy would lose its edge? So probably not. Actually, in this case, for what we're doing, because what we're leaning on are the really, really, really big players and where they care about it. So they would have okay. to, you'd be going against all the big players. Right, right. And okay. so that's why the strategy works is because we, we're the little fish going with the big fish and we just sure. try to just know yeah. where the big fish care the most to get those those turns properly. Yeah. yeah. Because oftentimes those big fish don't care about like, you know, things can swing against them bigly and they don't, really care because they've got a macro picture that they're working towards right um and so but we have to find where where, where they've they turned the throttle on and off and that's where we kind of engage and that works exceedingly well that makes sense yeah, yeah. but uh, again the smaller the time frame um especially with automated stuff um the noisier everything is just like with your eyes. And so it tends to be a little worse for, um, a lot of, you know, small folks. So you tend to look at more daily data and things like that, which, which can help, but using our, our framework and then layer on top of it, something that's a little faster. I think that's where really where things work fairly well to, to catch a lot of that. Well, I have to be frank with you. Like I had to, like when we started this podcast, I told you that I had like a terrible April. And what was funny is, is when I showed you my, my, uh, my tear sheet from last year, you were like, you noticed you're like, hey, wait a minute, La April last year was really shitty for you too. You which is just ironic. I don't know, you know, whatever, but maybe it's, maybe it's true. But, um, you know, what I had, my issue was, and, you know, it was something that, 
I don't know why this happens, but I'm sure it happens to everyone. You know, you start to get distracted with your original method or concepts, right? Like, so when I first met you, you know, you were super, like you were kind of a little bit more scalpy. And I used to- Much more scalp, yeah. And I used to tell you, you're going to hate the way I trade. I take two or three trades a day, but they count, you know? And Mm -hmm. so- you know, I kind of got lost myself into the smaller side of things and I was over trading and I was just, yeah, over trading. And it's just that mm-hmm. simple, right? And so in order to kind of get myself back in, in line, and this kind of just goes into what you were talking about, the smaller picture, I had to personally step back. Yeah. You know, I, I'm looking at, I'm like, okay, like I was, I was taking five or 10, sometimes 20 trades a day. I'm like, what the fuck is, you know, I don't trade like that. So, you know, now, you know, we've stepped mm-hmm. back a little bit. We're starting to look at the daily four hour time frames only again, like we were originally. And now here we are pulling monster trades, you know, 20 points is like, they better be 20 points. <laughs> right. Exactly. Because you're only getting in where, you know, people care. You know? Yeah. And, and it's, that's... It's, it's fixed everything for me, but it, it's just funny how, Man, there's so much noise in the smaller. And I don't know how I got steered off, but you were talking about the smaller and all this other stuff. I'm like, man. I will I will say something that's um a lot of people may not know, but you know, they always talk about how what percentage of trades are algo driven and, and things like that. Um, you know, but even if you put them uh, a stop loss in and it gets automated t- taken out, that's considered an algo trade because you didn't manually push the button. You had your level there and it stopped you out or you took profit. That's considered like an algo trade. So it kind of like skews the numbers a little bit, but I will say for like the professional firms, you know, they try to look at things that are disconnected to the market um, in terms of when they want to get in and, and such. And so the VIX is one of the major things that they look at. And so as the VIX goes down, you have less and less, you know, pure algo players in the in the mix, and in, as it goes up, the algo interaction goes gets higher and higher and higher. So that's why, like, when you see like these really big bursts of volatility, that's you know probably one hundred percent algo. And then as we get down to, um, you know, a VIX of eleven, it's you know less and less. So that's you know just something to keep in mind when you're looking at that volatility that who who's playing and those small time small time frame players are when the VIX gets higher and higher. And that's when you will get some of those crazy noisy moves. I'm definitely feeling the low VIX right now. It's the summertime doldrums are kind of kicking in. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've been waiting entire days for one move for one move. And that's, I think one of the hardest things about this low VIX environment is, you know, you wanted to get in at whatever, you know, whatever your level is, and then you'll get in, and if it doesn't just immediately accelerate away, you start to like second guess yourself, yeah. and then it starts to dribble, and then maybe it starts to get caught at VWAP. You're like, "Well, is VWAP it? Is that is I we're gonna make?" <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and you, you, we have those um, time and trade monitors that we look at because our best right. trades were in the longest. And you know, I think I was in a trade for two and a half, three hours yesterday, and it moved like. Eight points or something. Yeah, no. So, yeah, I mean, no, no like, when do I take this off? No, that <laughs> so moved the, low on on when we hit fifty three oh five and popped. Mm-hmm. It, it took forever to move twenty points. Like yeah. I knew where it was supposed to go, but I'm like, God damn! Like, <laughs> like, yeah, like exactly. am I wrong? Like, is this thing gonna go? Like, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's crazy. So yeah, this this is tough trading. Honestly, I mean, it's. I mean, it's interesting. It really has tested your patience and you really need to have some conviction in your thesis and your process when you're trading these, because this, these moves have been beast. <laughs> oh yeah. They've been... yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, that's, that's really, that's all I got, Rob, unless you yeah, guys. Yeah, no, I think it was yeah. good. I think we know what kind of like our outlook is for next week. And, you know, I'm, I gotta be honest. I'm just so uh just looking at the chart like in a vacuum i'm just so bullish and then the vix makes me think eh, it's this true. thing always creeps up but you know what the vix doesn't necessarily always correlated to the market move it, it could it could still climb up and just accelerate at a rate that the 
options guys aren't ready for, and that would also cause it to go up, you know? So it can go correlated. It can go up as the market goes up when that volatility is unexpected. So well, we certainly had, you know, what we've noticed and really stemmed from last weekend, that's what caught my attention. The VIX was like way down there and then we gapped, it gapped open on a Monday. And my assumption was, and the market still went up. And, you know, my assumption was, like we talked about, was that was just over the weekend risk that was essentially placed because it's hard not to want to buy that VIX. Like yeah. it, 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 I mean, insurance is really so cheap. It's so cheap to buy options right now. It's so cheap to buy this VIX. So, I mean, I get it, but, you know, it seems, you know, all they did was pop it and sell it all the way back down again all week. So, yeah, who knows? But like you said, they could pop it. And then one day when we finally do get some volatility, that'll be the catalyst. So mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. I, I agree with you looking at these charts. I mean, it's hard not to want to just buy everything. <laughs> yeah, you just do. Like, yeah. So my only issue, though, is, is that you and I just quasi discussed, you know, it really needs to go now because we've played our major support. And if it doesn't hold the lows from Friday, we can come down a decent little bit, which would it'd be welcome, but I'm just saying like- it, Yeah, like, we yeah. could go up. It's, the thing is we'd still be in the up leg though. You know yeah, what I mean? Exactly. We exactly. Could, it could just go down up and add some volume down there. At, you know, even 5284 where we had that dead space and yep. then Agreed. rock it up again. But I'm still like, I still think we're kind of on the, on the upstroke is what it feels like. Well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, you still got SPX that's clearly well in all time highs. We didn't even pull it up, but you got NQ, which has popped the all time high a few times, and it just played a big weekly daily. And so we're all, we're kind of hitting these, you know, the all time high support structures on both of these. And, you know, we looked at RTY, you and I, um, before this, and I was talking about a monster swing that I think is setting up. Uh, it, you know, if we pull back just a little bit, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really feel like we're still going. I mean, yeah, I think this can really happen all the way through the election year. Yeah, I, I, I call yeah. me crazy, but you know, <laughs> first off, tell me why it can't. Second off, and I've said this a few times, you got Powell, who mm -hmm. is not going to have a job if Trump comes into office. You've got Joe Biden, who's not going to have an uh, a position. <laughs> If, you know what I mean? You've got all these people who need to keep this market up so that they have some sort of ammunition to work with. Um, because, I mean, let's be honest, you know, smart money or big money, they put their money towards whoever's making them money, right? So it's all about the economy. It is, but the problem is, is the stock market and the economy are completely disconnected, right? Yes, like, but that's where the you know um, that's where the majority of wealthy people though make their money is in the stock market. Course. So that's where they're going to. Yeah, yeah. where their allegiances lie. For mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, who's making me money? So, all right, Rob. Well, that was it's all been right. a pleasure. Uh, until Thank next week, my great. Yeah, and I'll see you on Monday. Let's get it done. Yeah. I'll see you. <laughs>